good uh, or actually possibly good afternoon by now. A uh, warm welcome to you all to the Roots to Action, uh, which is uh, one of the events of the Food, Farming and Countryside Commission. Um, and uh, as I say, a warm welcome to you and lovely to see so many people on the call. Um, I'm Anne Jones and I'll be chairing the session today. Um, I'm a commissioner with the Food and Farming. Um, I'm also a member of the WI and uh, I'm currently uh, the National Vice Chairman and Chairman of National Public Affairs. Uh, but I'm also a farmer um, and have a special interest in farming and food, uh, hence my involvement in this commission. Um, we run a sheep farm and we are currently transitioning our beef farm into a dairy farm. Uh, so there's a great excitement um, on uh, Pant at the moment. Um, and like many other businesses, we're looking forward positively with the hope that uh, any transition that happens in the future will be a good one for farming and that there is a successful future for farming in Wales. Um, just a few housekeeping before I start. Um, this session is being recorded and will be available online afterwards. Um, if you don't want to be seen in the recording, then of course, turn your video off. Um, or if you don't want to be recorded at all, then you uh, now is the time to leave this session if that's your wish. Uh, but if you turn your video off, then uh, you won't be included. But personally, I'd like to see as many of you as possible because uh, it's great to see reactions uh, when we have speakers because it can sometimes look very bland and impersonal when we do things uh, via Zoom. Um, although useful to get us all from all over the country to be together, um, it also means that we can't see the reaction. So if you are happy to keep your video on, that would be really good. Um, you're all excellent. You're all on mute uh, because we don't want any background noises, any dogs barking or, or children or family running in with queries. Um, as I'm sure will happen to me during the day, it normally does. Um, and then finally, we would like to, to contribute in either Welsh or English, the language that you're happy with. Rwy'n siarad uh, Cymraeg, ac felly ni ni groi cynnig ar ni nawr i Welsh wrth mae'r translation ymwyth o. We're going to try and see how the translation works. Um, on the bottom of your screen, there is an interpretation button. So uh, next to mute, stop video, participants, chat, share screen and record, there's a button interpretation. If you can't speak Welsh, um, you're very welcome to click that button and press the English option. Um, and then when I speak in Welsh or any of the other uh, presenters speaking Welsh, you will hear it translated to English. Odini Amroy Kanigar Nidi Anest. Anest is our translator. So Rumini Wait a Khadigo area and Gamrag er boin booking cluid bits in digwith. A gabithio bochigid now and cluid hin and susneg or snadig in the ask Gamrag. Reaction from somebody, did that work? Yes, Sue is telling me that it did work. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Okay, so the uh, this is the final evidence gathering workshop uh, in our route to action. And uh, we'll be focusing on exploring uh, the prospects for a transition to agroecology here in Wales. Um, our brilliant lineup of speakers uh, will begin the discussion and after that, there will be a facilitated discussion addressing key questions. Uh, sadly, one of our speakers, Kevin, uh, has to leave at one. So we will be taking some questions immediately after each speaker. And then we'll have a longer session for all of our speakers um, after all three speakers have spoken. Um, all participants will be invited to join the Farming for Change Agroecology Network uh, and community. And these workshops will be recorded and record, recordings will be made available on our YouTube channel. So if you go to the Food Farming and Countryside Commission website, you can see, connect to the YouTube channel there. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers. Uh, they're the most important people here today. And firstly, uh, Professor Kevin Morgan. Uh, he's a Professor of Governance and Development at Cardiff University. And then next we will have Dr. Priscilla Williams. He's a senior lecturer in environmental management at Bangor University, where his research is focused 
agriculture and the environment. And he's also a farmer. And uh, our final speaker is Patrick Holden. Uh, is, he's the founder and chief executive of the Sustainable Food Trust. He's also an organic dairy farmer here in Wales. Um, and uh, Patrick and I don't live very far from each other. So um, we could uh, communicate by pigeon post if needed. Uh, and then our final guest this afternoon is Jane Davidson. And she's the Pro Vice Chancellor of uh, Emeritus at the University of Wales Trinity St. David and formerly Minister for Education and Minister for Environment and Sustainability in the Welsh Government. A very warm welcome to you all. Uh, can I encourage everybody to use the chat function? Tell us where you're from, um, but also in the chat function, any questions that you would have for any of our panel, please pop them in there. Um, and between Verity and myself, we'll try and uh, ask as many of them as possible. If you can keep your questions quite brief, that would be helpful. So without further ado, let's welcome our first speaker, and that's Professor Kevin Morgan. Kevin. Khan, and hello everyone. I've been asked to um, I've been asked to address uh, three issues for our agenda today. Uh, uh, some introductory remarks on the Welsh context. Secondly, the, uh, the, the what is needed for a, a just transition, and then thirdly, to say a few remarks on the role of public procurement in terms of fashioning a more sustainable food and farming system. So I'm, I'm acutely and indeed painfully aware of how much expertise is on this call. So I'm, I, I offer these as, as um, preliminary ideas that we might discuss rather than the, uh, the whole truth as it were. This is my perspective on the uh, on the issues before us, in terms in terms of the Welsh context, I think it's useful to, to 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 simplify it somewhat for the purpose of discussion by saying uh, we face a triple challenge. Let's put it like that: a triple challenge, which consists of the new net zero target, which I don't believe we have fully thought through the implications of in Wales, because. In Wales, we're good, we're good at willing the ends and finding it difficult to will the means. So there's, the, there's, the, there's the, the challenge of net zero. Secondly, there's the challenge of changing diets, something that Patrick and I have spoken about uh, over the last 20 years. And there, of course, as everybody knows, 80% of our ag is, is meat and dairy. And it, those sectors face enormous headwinds in terms of uh, the changing diets, particularly of younger cohorts. I'm thinking of my own, my own sons who are, are, are proselytizing on, 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 on behalf of, of oat milk, for, for example, just as a microcosm of the wider problem. Uh, and, and of course, uh, health messages about red meat reduction, so on and so forth. So big headwinds for a country that specializes in red meat and dairy, the sustainability challenge is enormous. And we've got to be really honest about the scale of the challenge. And then thirdly, a more, a more benign influence, but no less a challenge, is our world-class legislation. Uh, something that Jane will speak about, I'm sure, in terms of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, which provides an enabling framework, I think, and a, and a new sort of cognitive mental map as to what development could and should look like to get us away from that desiccated metric of just GVA per capita. Important as it is, it's not the only uh, way to define development. So those, those are the big challenges. And while Welsh government concedes that we have we have we have, we have we have not hit our carbon emission targets, they're prepared to concede that, but they are somewhat coy, I think, about relating that to our position in terms of not recognizing the need that agricultural 
that the composition of agricultural output needs to change and our land use patterns also needs to change because as many people uh, on this call will know in terms of land use, agriculture looms large, uh, possibly as much as 90%. Livestock constitutes a large share of our carbon emissions and agriculture generally has a high carbon footprint, indeed 12% of the Welsh total. So th those are big challenges, it seems to me, and they don't admit of any easy uh, uh, answers. And therefore, when we think of a transition, we must always think, I think, of a just transition. If there's not a just transition to help the, the farmers, workers in the food sector, employers in the food sector, to make this transition, if it's not just, it's not going to happen. It's just, let me put it as boldly as that. If there's no just transition, there will be no viable transition. And one example of this, we, we, we have just produced, I think, the, the best report we've ever done on the, on the food sector, particularly looking at the, the future for small and medium-sized firms in the Welsh food system, which uh, everyone can share uh, when Welsh government releases it. And, and in that report, we were shocked by the number of firms that said they never thought of turning to the Development Bank of Wales for help, whether in terms of equity or in terms of loans. And so much so, it's hard, I say this without being facetious, it's hard to know, I certainly don't know it, what the D stands for. What does the D stand for? in the name Development Bank of Wales, when small firms said to us, they preferred to go to the high street banks because their rates were better, oftentimes lower. And therefore the Development Bank, to my mind, I couldn't see how it was playing a developmental role in the food and farming sector. I think the new Welsh government in the sixth Senate needs to have an adult conversation with the Development Bank of Wales and say, let us help you to put the D back into your name. So that needs to be done as part of the suite of measures needed for a just transition. And in the few minutes I've got left, Anne, if I can quickly come on to public procurement. It has to be, you know, we've been working on public procurement in Wales in the food sector for, for, for nigh on 21 years now. And I can honestly say that nothing I know is equivalent in terms of become, having the status of a magic bullet. Every po political party in Wales, every part of the food system thinks that public procurement is something of a magic bullet, but it can't deliver everything we want it to deliver. From our own work, we've identified the two fundamental problems with public procurement has been an acute skill shortage in the public sector. That we don't have the skill sets to do whole life costing, for example. We've allowed, we've allowed a low cost to masquerade as best value because of our skill sets. And the second problem is a, a, a chronic failure of leadership in the Welsh public sector in terms of appreciating the strategic value of public procurement. In short, public procurement needs to come out, come from the back room into the boardroom of our organizations. But, and this is my final point, Anne, even if we sort these two problems out of skills and leadership, public procurement still has its limitations. Just to give one example from the Foundational Economy Research Group report on the food sector, the Welsh public sector spends around £94 million per annum on food and catering. £94 million per annum. That sounds like a lot, but it's not. It's equivalent to one Tesco hypermarket store. Equivalent to just one. And therefore, what we say in the report, public procurement has a major role to play in helping us to move to a sustainable food and farming system. 
but we need to disentangle two rationales for public procurement. Are we using it for a socio-cultural role? In other words, to raise the quality of food on the public plate? Or are we using it to boost, to play an economic promotion role in terms of boosting development prospects for food firms? In which case, we must engage with the food system intermediaries, supermarkets and food service distributors like Castel Howell, who are very important players in terms of, of building a more viable food system. Sorry to go on, Anne. I'll stop oh, at that point. That's excellent. Jochen Vaur, Kevin, Maunan Arbenig. We have had some questions in, uh, but I would agree with you that uh, the net zero is quite a challenge for us, um, especially you know, being a, a dairy and a sheep farmer. Mm -hmm. Um, I know full well that it's not going to be an easy time for us, uh, but some have put in about uh, peat bogs being some of the answer on cap carbon capture, etc. Uh, one of the questions that we've had in is, why is it that all socially, ethically based financial operations seem unable to compete in terms of market rates for lending and investing? And this seems to be a recurring uh, theme, doesn't it, within the banking industry? Well, it's a great question, and I wish I had a great answer, but I don't. I mean, we really need to look at, 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 at how our small micro and SME firms gain access to the kind of the, the, the patient capital, I'd call it, that they need to undertake a, 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 a just and green transition. There are opportunities facing us. But we've, I, I think in which we have tended to fritter away these opportunities by the silo working of Welsh government, uh, above all, where different departments need to work together in a much more coordinated, dare I say it, Anne, in a truly developmental way. Mm. Development is about encouraging people to come out of their silos, to work together in a concerted way, because the transition is a is a is a, is a, is, a, is a collective social endeavor and you can't let a farmer or a firm uh, meet this transition on their own that the, the problem in wales isn't being small the problem is being lonely where you're not connected to a wider network of collaborators uh, i've got two further questions that have come in uh, one following on from that is how op how optimistic are you that the new Welsh government has the appetite to take radical action? And the second one would be about broadband issues, uh, where to go for help and information, information on how to transition if they haven't got access to IT equipment and a good broadband access. Uh, we all know that without it these days, we can't survive. And uh, I'm sure I'm not the only one that has had uh, coming up on their Zoom chat saying, your broadband is unstable. Very quickly, Anne, because I know other people want to talk as well. Taking the latter first, I've, I've been fortunate to be the chair of the Carmarthenshire Business Advisory Group, advising on the COVID recovery in Carmarthenshire and taking the rural question seriously. Because, you know, the rural question has been marginalised in most countries for the last 20, 30 years by the rise of cities and city regions. And we're very fortunate today to have on the call Professor Neil Ward, who is one of the finest experts on regional strategy that I, that I know of. So I hope Neil will at some point come to my rescue here and also add his thoughts. But from the Carmarthenshire job, Anne, I can say that all the business men and women on that advisory group have all said that digital is their number one priority, regardless of their sector. So we're going to be putting a lot of heat on Welsh government, particularly on Lee Waters, who has the brief for digital, to raise the game on digital access in rural areas. So that's got to be one of our top priorities for rural Wales. Uh, in terms of the first question, and I've forgotten it. Right. Okay. No problem. Um, it's how optimistic are you 
that the Welsh Government has the appetite to take the radical action that's needed? Well, I'm, I'm, you know, I've got enormous respect for Mark Drakeford and what he's done in terms of being a steward for the nation through the pandemic. Uh, but, but, but I fear, you know, we, we don't, we don't. I speak as a devolutionist, but I, I have to say that you know the biggest problem in the Welsh government is the disconnect between its responsibilities, which have grown like hell over the last twenty years and its capacity to deliver them, which has been almost static. Mm. And, and we've got to recognise that that disconnect exists and it stymies everything. And I've suggested to Mark and his team that we make a virtue out of necessity and Welsh Government works in concert with the stakeholders in the economy, with business, with food and farming players, with universities, to build that capacity that doesn't exist within Welsh Government. That's what we call a stakeholder development system uh, or co-production. And Wales needs to pioneer this if we're going to realise the promise of the well-being for future generations legislation. Cardiff Bay cannot do it on its own and nor should it seek to. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, we're going to take advantage of the time that you're with us. So I'm changing the order a little. So if you're happy, I've got one final question that I'd like to ask you. Um, and it's from somebody on the panel. Um, so not from the panel, from on the call. Um, he says, uh, Kevin's low cost masquerading as best value could be a description of how we value our food in our current system. How can we shift the valuation away from food from low cost to best value? And I would say that this is probably something that I've been banging on about for a long time, is that we undervalue our food. Uh, well, it, it, it's, it's the question I think has driven my research for 21 years on public procurement of, of school food. It's shocking to find when you look at public contracts where, where they are sometimes weighted as much as 70 or 80 percent in favour of price and quality doesn't loom very large. We are now seeing in the, in the time of, of well-being of legislation, uh, with social value, for example, we are seeing quality being weighted higher. But I think eventually we need to get a 50-50 on. Honestly, some municipalities in England are moving towards those in public contracts. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say some Welsh health boards are real laggards and not leaders in terms of reweighting their contracts between quality and price. We really need to push that quality message if we're going to hold out some hope for primary producers and small uh, food producers as well. That's absolutely critical to the reskilling of, of the public sector procurement managers. Uh, Kevin. Thank you very much for that, Kevin, and for being with us today. I know you will be leaving at us one. I hope you can wait uh, and listen to some of the discussions that will go ahead uh, in the next half hour or so. Uh, but thank you for your contribution uh, on behalf of everybody on the call. Uh, we'll move on next then to uh, Dr. Prasor Williams. Croeso Cynnes Prasor. Drosdoi chi. Dechor iawn, Ann, a diolch am y gwahoddiad a'r cyflau siarad. Um, mae ran un sgrin ar wan. Nes dwi'n cymryd fach yn gweld y sgrin. Ia, diolch am y gwahoddiad i siarad. Uh, Digwyddiad diddorol, ofnadwy am serol iawn iawn yn eisiau bod yn rhai y gwrando'r Kevin Rwan hefyd. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, give this talk and to contribute to this great event. Um, so agroecology, agro is it the future of farming in Wales? And, and obviously um, Welsh agriculture is dominated by ruminant systems and, and uh, that's what I'm you know, for that reason, that's what I'm going to, to focus on. Uh, so I'll be drawing from uh, a lot of the research that we are doing at Bangor University. This is very much um, 
part of the day job really um when i'm not uh working on the or farming at home uh, I'm, I'm researching a lot in the area between agriculture and the environment and there's a quite a, a big team of us at bangor doing that and uh, a lot of research activity uh, why do we have why does wales or welsh agriculture have um well, why is it dominated by a ruminant production system as well it's clearly a reflection of Wales's topography, its soils, and its climate, uh, along with one or two other things. So there are, you know, there's a lot of talk about what we can change in agriculture. It's also important to remember what we cannot change, and uh, that is a point I think that maybe isn't always um, recognised or even uh, understood. So we have a lot of soils that are classified as, as grade five or grade four or, or grade three um, there's not very much blue on the map there which is grade one or two so that clearly influences what we cannot what we can and what we cannot um, do in terms of agricultural production here in wales um the dipping bar or figure in van hin uh, a few facts and figures from um defran from hubiki kimri i'm not going to go through all of these at all i'm sure you can read them in the time that i'm talking but we have around nine million heads of sheep just over a million head of, of cattle and calves um, in wales we are a big producer of, of lamb we are a big producer a fairly big producer of, of beef um and you know we are dominated by quite small systems really in terms of herd sizes and flock sizes um we have uh, quite small farms we you know, there's a lot to talk about family farms and so on and we have about fifteen thousand holdings depending how holdings are counted um so there's a huge social value as well and i mean the economic value this number at the bottom here red meat sector red meat production is worth an estimated 690 million pounds to the welsh economy uh, well that's, that was the figure in 2018 anyway um the, the processing sector on, on, on top of that and so on the figure obviously increases quite dramatically so there's a big economic value to all of this um but there's the social value, of course, as well. Erachor, we can all erachor yeithadol hot hot wishik kovia hin. It's all part of the picture. When we talk about sustainability, we talk about economics, we talk about the environment, and we talk about the social elements. And looking at three in tandem is fundamental, in my view. Um, and my pitha and newit things are changing. Um, no industry can stay in the same place forever and there's certainly change happening in agriculture and if we would have had one of these crystal balls 16 18 months ago who would ever have thought that covid would have stopped us in, its, in our tracks in the way that it has so i don't have a crystal ball but maybe if you know of one um pass it my way so what is changing there are things that we do know about uh, but there are surprises, of course, such as COVID along the way that we most definitely do not know about. Um, we most definitely know about the concerns, that the increasing concerns about the environmental impacts of livestock production systems. There's no shortage of, of articles in, in the media. Um, yeah, and you can see two examples here, articles that portray the livestock sector in a very particular uh, light. And uh, this is daily news now. It's not something that, um, you know, is of concern to a small cohort of people. This is mainstream uh, news these days. And of course, you know, um, be that talking about carbon, which, which Kevin referred to a number of times, or be that talking about impacts of, of agriculture on biodiversity um, or on ammonia emissions. We know that agriculture is by far and away the biggest source of ammonia emissions. Um, we know about the SONA report in Wales that made for quite grim reading, to be honest. Um, and you know the, the loss of biodiversity is a, is a major, major issue. 
And of course, very timely and very topical, um, the announcements by Welsh Government quite recently that the whole of Wales is now going to be an NVZ. Um, Mar effeithia am gylcheddol am maith yn y bath sydd yn y newyddion o hyd a go hyd a go hyd a mae o'n effeithio ar amaith ar lawr gwlad fel petai um, a dyma esiampl dda um, da ni'n gweld y pennawd ar y dde yn y fan yna lle. Um, these environmental impacts ultimately can come back to bite the industry and you know there are changes in regulations and so on and uh, some of which are, are very unpopular. Um, governments, of course, are under is under Welsh government, UK government is under obligations to meet the um, what it signed up to in the Paris Agreement. We have mul a multitude of, of reports and so on about how we achieve net zero. And mentioned the challenges of achieving net zero um, in agriculture. And yes, they they are challenging to say the least. Um, but you know. Governments are clearly taking a lot of interest to this because they've signed an agreement, a legal agreement to reach net zero by 2050. So agriculture will have to play its part. Uh, and of course, um, at the same time, then Brexit has happened and we could spend the whole afternoon discussing Brexit. But it does mean that uh, maybe for some people, this is the opportunity that they've been craving for decades to bring about a real change in government policy. And we most definitely have an idea of the direction of travel that Welsh governments have, have placed on the sort of on the table, so to speak, even if we don't know the detail as yet. And of course, the devil is always in the detail. Um, we do most definitely know that we are heading towards a sort of rewarding by of delivering public goods and so on. Maybe I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. But we've had three consultation documents, which in many ways are very, very similar. And um, we know where we're going, roughly. Uh, and then, of course, we've got consumers out there. Uh, and Kevin referred to his sons. Um, you know, I, I deal with students every day. Uh, people are thinking more and more about where food comes from and some of them are choosing to impact, to change their diets um, and asking quite serious questions about the industry. So there's, you know, where does this leave red meat production in Wales? Lle mae o'n gadael am a thyddiaeth yng Nghymru a gwrth gwrs cynhyrchu cu coch yn chynhyrch llaeth yn benodol. Lle mae o'n gadael y sector? Um, well, a few months ago, Hubby Key Cymru, Meat Promotion Wales, they released their vision, if you like, for um, the Welsh way, how we are, as you can see from the top there, how the Welsh agriculture is going to be a global leader in sustainable lamb and beef production. And this is a, a document that received a lot of, of attention in the media and so on. Um, you know, it's, it's quite ambitious. Being a global leader in sustainability or in how sustainable lamb and beef can be produced. Uh, so obviously the industry will need to prove this. It's all very well and good saying this. And we've got to remember that almost everybody is at it. Okay, so the messages coming out from Ireland on the left and Australia in the middle or New Zealand on the right, we're, we're all talking the same language essentially. Um, that, you know, red meat or dairy products produced in Ireland or Australia or in New Zealand is amongst the most sustainable or if not or, or possibly the most sustainable in the world. So this is clearly um, you know all the competitors are at it so the Welsh agriculture will need to, to step up to the plate. And if we look at where our emissions come from, um, greenhouse gas emissions, then it's roughly a third between dairy, beef and sheep. In, in Wales, roughly a third, and of course, um, uh, methane is is uh, the overwhelming biggest component of uh, farms' carbon footprints, and that's something that we've been doing a lot for many years at Bangor, um, going onto farms and calculating their carbon footprints, um, and also looking at sequestration, and there's a lot of models and, and tools and so on 
and studies in the past have only considered emissions on farms and what farmers are always uh, you know, quite vocal about and, and probably rightly so is that they are also as well as being a source of greenhouse gas emissions they are sequestering most farms will be sequestering as well so we want to uh, see the, the net difference we talk a lot about net zero so what is the difference between sequestration and emissions and it's quite interesting and, and encouraging to see now that farmers in Wales can actually access funding to a carbon footprint or carbon assessment done through uh, the Farming Connect programme. So, um, you know, there's a lot of interest amongst farmers in this. They're, they're, um, I, I get asked to give a lot of talks on this topic at the moment. So the, the industry is taking note of all this. Um, we've just done some work with a Peaky Cymru actually with with 20 farms across Wales from a range of different production systems. These are beef and sheep farms, so upland, lowland, extensive, intensive, and so on. We used our own carbon footprinting tool, and I've got at most three slides to show from the work that we've done. And this um, graph here shows the results for the 11 hill farms that we had. Uh, take part in the project, the net emissions. And just one thing I want to say from that slide is, you know, it's not a, a one size fits all approach. I get really frustrated and quite annoyed by tarring the whole industry with the same brush and even global averages that we hear being used time and time again. I mean, you know, using an, an average for uh, 10 farms in the same valley can can be very misleading let alone a global average we know that there's big diversity between farms that seemingly look um, or, or are producing the same product in on the same soils in the same area and the really interesting part of all of this is understanding why these differences exist as opposed to just using an average which hides a lot of really interesting data and I'm not going to go through this in detail, but I'm going to just show two colours on the pie charts here. So these were the, the breakdown of emissions from hill, upland and, and lowland farms and the peach colour are methane emissions and the grey colours uh, represent nitrous oxide emissions. So essentially, you know, um, on on essentially all farms, methane emissions accounted for about 50% of the total farm footprint. So achieving net zero is going to be challenging um, without uh, possible changes in livestock numbers. And if we look at, at sequestration, then um, soils, estimating sequestration is always quite challenging, but soils are really important. Um, but we need more trees probably on farms as well. We, some of the farms, they had very, very low coverage of, of trees. And, um, you know, there's no doubt room for more on the right tree in the right place, as I say, and others have said as well. It's not sort of block afforestation of farms. It's uh, increasing tree cover in, in the appropriate way. So just uh, on the last two slides now, and uh, no, I've got a minute or two, over, gone a minute or two over time. So how do we reduce agriculture, Welsh agriculture's environmental impact? We could have a whole week of discussion about how we do this, but I think it's the combination of the old and the new. Okay, new technologies, apps, drones, sensors, you know, digital um, developments and so on, definitely part of the answer but I always think that we need to uh, not get too excited of, of new technology and what might be coming and, and you know lose sight of what we already know. I've been reading some books that was written by a that were written by a professor of agriculture at Bangor uh, 110 years ago and essentially nothing has changed. You know the same messages about soil health, soil fertility, the value of clover, here we go. We think we're clever these days talking about these things, but we've been talking for over a century about them. So it's the combination of old and new, I would say. And, um, uh, you know, it might be diet supplements for, for ruminants has its limitation. It's soil sampling um, combined with, with new gadgets as well, of course. Both have room to play. And 
yeah, some brand this is sustainable intensification. Do you maintain food production on this on 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 a smaller land mass, freeing up land for for other you know purposes, conservation purposes, or storing carbon? I mean, this is all up for discussion, really. And of course, research. You know, you'd expect me as a researcher to say this, but if we're not researching, we're not moving forward. If we're moving forward, we're going backwards. So research has to play a big role in the future um, and yeah we've got to recognize that not all e system systems are equal you know grassland system that is a feedlot in america grassland systems can have a lower environmental impact but the fact that wales is grass based doesn't mean we let off the hook at all that is something of a of a sort of misnomer that i sometimes here and um, can deliver biodiversity benefits as well of course and um, you know it might be the future for Wales, Wales produce is that we go for this premium market the less is more better quality and try and get a premium for those I think there's huge scope to learn from each other we've seen this with discussion groups sharing best practice and so on um, you know every business can can learn from another business you never stop learning you never stop improving and um, there's huge scope but we need the tools in place to make it happen and then the last um slide uh is agroecology the future of farming in wales that was one of the questions the overarching questions uh well the need to act on environmental challenges be it biodiversity crisis be it climate change these will not disappear you know, this is going to increase um, as we go along with time, not, not sort of fall away and be forgotten about. The public will expect this, governments will expect this. Um, some farmers will see the opportunities within a challenge. There's no doubt a challenge or challenges here, but the, there are opportunities as well, and it might be through reducing costs, you know, better use of fertilizer or no use of fertilizer, and, and efficiency gains, and of course, the future schemes coming along might offer some opportunities but there are huge uncertainties and I get really you know I spend a lot of time probably too much time thinking about all this but what the market does especially you know we still don't really know what the market post Brexit will look like and so on that can have huge influence on all of this discussion um, and there are as I said some things I said at the very beginning there are some things we cannot change and um, the restrictions in terms of what we can do what we cannot do and I'm also concerned about being overly focused on carbon. There are other environmental issues to think about. So in summary, I would say agroecology principles have much to offer. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, as uh, uh, Professor Kevin said in uh, the chat, that was an excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I think we'll keep the questions until the plenary session so that we give uh, Patrick uh, an opportunity to speak. Uh, I didn't want to stop you, Professor, because it was such a good presentation. So over to you, Patrick, and uh, your view on all of this. Uh, you're muted, Patrick, sorry. Sorry about that. Thank you very much. I agree, two excellent presentations. Um, I've been active in the chat, sorry about that, Anne. Um, uh, I'll pick up on some of the points that were made, but just to, I suppose I would, I think I, I would like to start with a perspective on the agroecological transition from the point of view of farming. And I think it's important to stress that unless the kind of farming systems that all of us probably on this uh, Zoom want pay, farmers won't be able to switch to them. So my first point is it's really all about the money. Um, at the until now, you can't really blame farmers, the farmers who I feel uncomfortable uh, about their practices, the farmers who have intensified, uh, there are quite a few intensive dairy herds around us here where they're hundreds and hundreds of cows so they are mostly outdoor you know new zealand style grazing systems but obviously i know other farms where the cows are permanently housed and it's an interesting factoid that more than half the milk that is now produced in the uk uh, consumed in the uk comes from cows that never get out 
Uh, but it isn't just from the cows that never get out we've got problems. It's, in, it's the cows that do get out, and too many of them, on these vast, you know, semi-industrial uh, grazing systems where, frankly, it pays the farmers to do that. So it, it is about the money. And so farmers have become commodity slaves trapped into a system where they have to produce ever more food sold at rather low prices to survive. And only a few weird people like me, who was, you know, a back to the lander who has a day job and other advantages, managed to sort of step out of that assist uh, that treadmill and do something different. So I'm kind of speaking from the luxury position of having done something different for a long period of time. And I would say what we've been trying to do here on the farm, which is about 300 acres now, with a dairy herd of 80 Ayrshire cows and young stock, including the male cars that we rear re for veal, and a vertically integrated operation where we make just about all the milk we're producing into a single farm raw milk cheese. It's all very well for me to sort of say this is a good system, but if it doesn't, if farmers who are contemplating farming in a different way can't see a way to make those systems pay, it's, net, it's not going to go mainstream. So I want to sp spend some of the time talking about what changes need to be made to enable agroecological systems to become more mainstream. And so I would say the first point is uh, we need financial incentives. That's sort of carrots if you like we need carrots and sticks but let's talk about the carrots first the welsh government agricultural policy team i think are in the process of designing a post-brexit policy package which will uh, be available to all farmers on a whole farm basis and will if they stick to their guns uh, provide real financial incentives uh, for most of the money that we're currently getting as kind of social security payments without conditions, the single farm payment, to be redirected and only re re received by farmers who adopt agroecological practices. And this will be uh, some of the points that have already been made, practices which uh, reduce emissions, uh, which improve biodiversity, which improve water quality, which build soil carbon, um, which have social and cultural positive impacts as well. And I believe that the uh, agricultural policy team are thinking holistically. I think that many of the team are connected to the land, so they have farming backgrounds, which is a massive advantage. And with a bit of luck, quite soon now, we're going to have a pilot for uh, the Sustainable Farming Scheme in Wales, which I think will make DEFRA blush because it is embarrassing how bad the DEFRA discussion is. There's no vision and no leadership there. And after all these years after the Brexit vote, they're almost nowhere. And it, the worry is that even the, the, the sustainable farming scheme they are developing is going to be marginal in terms of the cash. Because if we say we're getting about 80 to 100 pounds an acre at the moment of the single farm payment, the vast majority of that money needs to go into a whole farm scheme, which is you know, dependent on the adoption of practices which are delivering public goods. And I think Wales just might lead the world in the, in the launch of that scheme. So that's a massive blessing and really, really exciting. Um, just one example, so that's the carrot bit, the stick bit. There's been a massive discussion about the NVZ proposal, which the Welsh government have, um, have suggested. And the NFU Cymru are taking legal action to try and stop this scheme from going ahead. Well, you know, um, John Pentra, John Davis is a personal friend of mine, and I'll say this, I think the NFU are wrong on this. And last week's Farmers Weekly had a two page spread featuring farmers who are going to be affected if the NVZ stuff goes ahead. And all of them were overstocked. And my message to farmers is, it's in our interest to destock. We want to farm in harmony with nature. We don't want to have vast herds of cattle that are poaching the ground in these extreme rainfall conditions that are causing water pollution and that are, are causing you know high emissions we want to farm within the carrying capacity of the land and i believe that the carrying capacity of the land includes the potential of a herd to walk to grass twice a day during grazing season um, and graze without nitrogen fertilizer because nitrogen fertilizer is just you're just using the land as a platform to carry the animals we need to farm within the natural ecology and holding 
um, capacity of the land as we've been doing now for 48 years. And it is surprising how much food you can produce if you farm in that way. So my, my message to farmers who are worried about the Welsh government putting more restrictions on them is don't worry, feel good about it. Feel good that Wales could lead the world in having a better story about our livestock, a better story about our grasslands. And actually, as we've seen recently with livestock prices, there's nothing like um, scarcity to put up the prices of lamb and beef, uh, which is a Brexit related thing, a weird Brexit related thing. So I just want to start with that message that there is cause for significant optimism here. And if the Welsh government and indeed other governments and regulators have the courage to make the polluter pay and to regulate against the worst practices, all farmers will benefit. So I don't want to blame the farmers for what, what we have done, but let's celebrate the fact that if we farm in a different way now and it pays, most farmers in their hearts would rather do that as long as there was an economic case for it. So we need to make sure that there is an economic case for doing this. So that's my second point. Um, the regulation I've already touched with. The third point I would make is these are the sort of enabling conditions to allow this transition to take place. We need a massive education programme because uh, Kevin's touched on this and Price as well. I think that the public need to understand the right answer to the question, what should I eat to be sustainable and healthy? And the answer is we should eat what the farmers of our country, landscape, region produce in the proportions that they can produce it if they use regenerative farming methods. And in Wales, a nation of grass, we can produce wonderful grass-fed and mainly grass-fed uh, dairy products, lamb and beef. And of course, we don't want to promote just a carnivorous and animal-based solution on its own, but we should recognize that most people think that it's the right thing to do to eat cheap chicken from Thailand or God knows what other products. I went into a restaurant, I won't say where it was the other day, that had recently closed down and I bought a chest freezer. And I looked at the contents of the chest freezer and it was just appalling, the stuff that most restaurants serve in Wales. It was, it was embarrassing, it was, just, it was just frightening really. They were kind of, as Michael Pollan said, food-like substances from industrial agriculture. Everything in there was just you know, something you wouldn't want to eat if you knew the story behind the food. So we need a massive education program uh, so that we encourage as many people in Wales as possible to base their diets of staple foods on the productive capacity of the farms of the future. And we can do this. And Kevin has been, you know, treading this lonely path for so many decades now, trying to get better public procurement. And he's right to say there's a failure of leadership. I mean, even in the independent sector of schools, it's incredible, Holroyd Howe, who've got a sort of monopoly on some of the independent school sourcing in, in Wales. I mean, they source cheap ingredients. They may uh, use a fig leaf of respectability by saying they use Welsh wholesalers, but that's not good enough. It's got to be supplies of staple foods from farms in Wales that are producing food in a sustainable way. And that needs to be the message, not just to the public procurement sector, but indeed to everyone, including retailers. I was talking to John Pentra the other day about calling the supermarkets together in Wales and saying, what are you doing about sourcing genuine Welsh products, which are not killed in abattoirs that slaughter millions of animals, but are killed in local abattoirs and processed in a vertically integrated way on farms. And we need to get radical about this because at the moment we have a food system which is based on vast scale production, high centralization, and an, an anonymity which goes right through to the labeling. So it's very, very difficult at the moment if you go into a supermarket and you want to buy better food to identify where it is. And I believe that the supermarkets will respond to this challenge because they are in the end in the grip of their own customers. We are their customers. So if we change, they change. So I think with regards to the last bit of the transition, the bit that in a way Kevin and many others have been grappling with, and I had a wonderful conversation with Simon Wright, who's on this um, Zoom earlier yesterday. Um, we haven't really got the infrastructure to enable the vertically integrated development of the food systems of the future. So, you know, taking ourselves as a case study, 
we decided a couple of years ago to save all the male calves from our Ayrshire herd and turn them into ruby veal, rearing into about 11 months old on the farm, and then trying to get them um, slaughtered in Tregaron. We're lucky enough to have a local abattoir, of course, and then the meat processed. But we haven't got the facility uh, to process the meat on the farm. The EHOs, I don't think, you know, I'm not blaming them, but they're, they're, they're still living in a sort of past atmosphere of fear of bacteria, if you know what I mean, which is a very pervasive viral condition which affects all the regulators of the food industry and makes it very, very difficult for small scale processors to add value to their primary products because they have to be so meet such draconian hygiene regulations that many of them are frightened off from doing it. So we're currently relying on the butcher, uh, vertically integrated butcher and abattoir and Intragara to uh, produce our veal and we're managing to make a go of it, but we want to take it to scale. And if we can't do it easily, then thousands of other Welsh livestock farmers who are looking at this, who are you know, in the grip of commodity slavery supplying them, no offense to the abattoirs they supply, or we've supplied them too, but they're just too big. And all these people who are going vegan, young people mainly who are going vegan, I think it's a sort of visceral reaction to the industrialization of slaughtering in part. So we need a different story for the end of the lives of our animals. And we can do this if we get these messages across. So I think there is a, to, to my last point really is, is you know, I, I believe that Simon Wright and others on this call who are doing everything they can to relocalize food systems deserve all the support they could get. And, uh, but we do need leadership. And I think that was a point that Kevin made. We need a huge amount of leadership. The people in positions of influence need to recognize that we are in the last chance saloon on climate change and biodiversity loss and arguably public health as well. And now is the time to take risks, to say, no, the old system is finished. It's not serving the public interest. You know, the treasury are not going to back public money for public goods unless they can see that they really are being delivered and everything that we've been discussing on this call is about delivering real public goods i'd love to say lots more but probably i've had my allotted time so i'll pause i think one of the issues that is really of concern i'll throw in a challenging one right at the end is the use of roundup roundup is so widely used now in wales for killing off pastures it's a poison it's, it's, it's getting everywhere and it's, it's interfering with the soil bio, biome, microbiome, and it's getting right through to people who eat food. I think we are collectively in the farming community poisoning the planet with the use of Roundup. I know that's a contentious thing to end on, but we really need to think about some of these issues and take action on them. So uh, that, that'll do for me, I think. Shut up, Paddy, as my brother would say. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, as usual, you put it uh, in plain English so that everybody can understand the issues facing uh, Welsh farmers, be it on a, a big scale or on a small scale. Jochen uh, Valram, that, Patrick. Uh, we'll move into our plenary session now. Um, sadly, we have lost uh, Kevin, um, but uh, he's enjoyed being with us and I've thanked him on your behalf for his contribution today. Uh, so I'll start the first question, and this is specifically for Prasad. Um, it has been discussed in the chat, but it would be good to hear your views on it. Um, and the question is asking, is the reduction in meat and milk farming wares really necessary or even appropriate uh, to meet climate and other environmental targets? Or is it about curbing large scale intensive livestock operations in the UK more generally? So, you know, is it right to cut back in a, a land where, as you said in your map, uh, we have the challenges of, of hills, mountains, poor soil, uh, climate, etc. cetera. Uh, so was the question specifically about production or consumption? And sorry. Production. Production. Okay, well, if you look at the climate change projections um, or projections for a climate change world, if you like, uh, to put it slightly differently, uh, in 20, 30 years time, then the West of Europe will be more important than ever, probably for, for uh, ruminant systems and, or grass-based systems. And, and, you know, we, we, well, they are predicting huge areas of, of, um, 
Australia, for instance, to, to essentially turn into, into desert. Uh, and of course, Australia is one of the biggest beef producers in the world and, and a huge producer of lamb as well. So um, in that sense, then, you know, uh, for the global uh, production of, of meat uh, or red meat and, and dairy products, then if we do want grass-based systems, then it, it makes a lot of sense to... Um, nurture what we have and get better at it as opposed to giving up altogether. <clears throat> that is, unless there is a change in consumption, which is why I, I just asked for the clarification. But there is no point in us shutting down an industry only for us then to import the equivalent product from another region in the world, um, you know, offshoring our impacts. We've done it with so many other, other industries. If you just consider that lap the laptop that I'm using at the moment or the fridge in the room next door, they've probably both been imported from, from Asia um, and produced uh, to regulations that might, well, probably be much less stringent from an environmental perspective. Um, nobody's living without laptops, nobody's living without fridges, so we're still having the environmental impact that's happening somewhere else. And that's not the route that we need to go down for um, meat and milk production either. Um, but we do need to get better at it, no, no doubt about it. There are changes necessary. Um, and, you know, it's not a sort of one-size-fits-all, silver-bullet approach. Every farm is, is slightly different. And essentially, it's a, it's a combination of different answers that will help us, help us get to that point. So uh, I would say, yeah, we have got the climate. We can grow grass is good, almost as good as anybody else in the world. Um, so we've got the climate and, and topography and soils for it, and, and it would be uh, um, probably shooting ourselves uh, or the environment in the foot, so to speak, if we just import the equivalent product from elsewhere. Thank you, Professor. That's a, a, a standpoint that um, I think a lot would agree with, um, in that uh, we have to make the best of what we have. Um, but we have to do it in the most environmentally sensitive way that we can. So we will find changes and farmers have been notoriously good at adapting to change. Um, and I particularly like what um, Patrick said that um, you know, a carrot and stick approach is often a useful way of getting change. Um, and the Welsh Government can definitely include that uh, in their policies to encourage good practice uh, and penalise really bad practice. So it's a uh, it's a bit of both, so thank you. Um, um, could I just comment on on the point about offshoring? Yes. Because it seems to me that I completely understand that we don't want to simply ban something and then buy it from abroad. But let's take the case of intensive poultry production in Wales. There are many farmers in Powys in particular who are putting in these sheds and buying feed from North and South America mainly. And it was, uh, I think there was something in the news today that it's 80% of the emissions are coming from the production of the grain to produce food for an apparently insatiable market for poultry, which everyone thinks is somehow for some weird reason is more um, uh, uh, emission friendly than um, grass fed red meat, which is absolutely wrong. We could discuss that. But surely if the, if, the argument that we should keep these intensive poultry production units is used because there's a demand. That's wrong. We, we, yes, we would offshore it if the public didn't understand that buying cheap poultry has to end. So we need a combination of carrot sticks and education. And we need to explain to, to people, young people in particular, that intensively produced chicken is actually uh, it's, it's, it's dishonestly priced because the cost, the true cost of the intensively produced chicken is climate change, biodiversity loss in, um, in other countries. And we shouldn't simply say, well, we can produce it in a, a better way than somebody in Thailand. So therefore we should do it. We need to change the demand. So I think that, yes, we want to avoid offshoring, but at the, at the same time, we need to lead and accept responsibility that if we're doing something which is fundamentally wrong environmentally and in terms of welfare, we, we, the Welsh government shouldn't be afraid of making it more difficult to put those units to survive because they are polluting the rivers. They're causing huge problems at the moment. And, the, and many of the problems are in Wales, but some of the problems are in South and North America. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, uh, that's a, a, an interesting viewpoint on chicken farming within Wales. Uh, but I think Prasa was particularly referring to red meat production and dairy 
rather than uh, the production of chicken. But uh, that's a good Yes, well, I, I agree with that. Of course, there's the Australian deal going through at the moment, which is appalling. You know, that's really a disaster. The, um, the trade deal with Australia, we can talk more about that if you want. Uh, that's for another day, I think, Patrick, because I think okay. we could spend an entire meeting on uh, the Australia, well, the possible Australian deal and the impact that would have uh, on Welsh farming, uh, on UK farming, actually. Um, yeah. We've got an interesting question for both of you um, about linking farms to supply uh, in cities and uh, large towns directly, uh, rather than relying on a middleman and reducing the use for IT connection and broadband. Uh, any comments on that from either of you? If not, we'll move on. I think uh, it, the idea of um, cities forming direct links with farms, peri-urban farms, but also farms further afield is a wonderful idea because really a farmer can produce if we know that somebody wants our food. So if there was a buying group in Cardiff that wanted Ruby Veal, just to you know, give my own example, this would be fantastic. And if it could go directly to the people who knew the story of this farm and you know, wanted to do that, I think that could be replicated amongst thousands of farms and it would give them security, it would cut out the, all the links in the food chain where inevitably there are gonna be margins added. So I think it's a brilliant idea and maybe the government, the Welsh government needs to factor that in to the incentives uh, for the future farming scheme to give support to setting up these buying groups. Uh, it would be quite an expensive scheme, I presume. Um, and it would be a niche scheme. Do you think there would be any solution to the overall problem for Welsh farmers or would it only be addressing uh, a solution to a few? Uh, I think it could go to scale. Like why shouldn't it go to scale? Why shouldn't we have a far more of our food coming, whether even if it comes through shops from, you know, farms whose stories are known so that people are in a way when they buy their food, they're buying the story of the farm. I think it could go to scale. It could even go through supermarkets. I think if it went through supermarkets, there might be a possibility because we're not going to change our consumers. Um, you know, I know within uh, the WI, who are a big consumer a group that you know most people these days do their shopping in supermarkets and uh, it's for convenience it is because of time uh Prasad, have you any views on this well i was just going to say very similar things uh and really i mean uh i'm all for change and and you know some of the ideas and aspirations patrick has, has put forward sound fantastic but we've got to remember that um, we're catering to the masses as well and you know what you've just said and you know I don't see many supermarkets closing down very quickly um, I mean many people don't even need to leave the couch now to put in their weekly shop um, you know they just do it off their phone so I mean I think we're at a time it's quite an interesting time really there's on the one hand there's never been so much interest in how food is produced but on the other hand there's never been less interest and a bigger disconnect on how food about how food is produced as well. And my fear is that with every passing generation, the link between, um, you know, the link, the direct link that people have between um, themselves and, and food production. You know, they might have a grandparents that used to live on a farm or a great grandparents, and you know, and that link just gets wider or, or longer and longer, and weaker and weaker. And there's a much poorer understanding of how food is produced and as a result people don't question don't see the value of food they just see price and um, they cannot question what is sustainable what is not and so on and we've got to remember that i mean you mentioned niche uh, markets and um you know we could be uh, advocating farmers markets and so on, you know, till the cows come home. But ultimately, that is a smidgen of what is a huge market at the end of the day. And and I I also you know I sometimes get a bit concerned that some of the people dreaming up food policies and so on, you know, they're the type of people that do shop in in local farmers markets and so on. And and they you know they they don't see the need possibly that. Many people have to buy a chicken for two ninety nine 
to feed their family. I mean, we're no not one has there. a need to buy a two ninety nine chicken because well, it's dishonestly priced. I, I know, it, I, I know that. Sick. I, I know that that it, it, it's de definitely dishonestly priced. There is a cost somewhere else. Some someone or something else is paying the price, and and you know the environment is is one example. That is absolutely true. But the the person who needs that chicken for two ninety nine, or in their view, needs that chicken for two ninety nine doesn't know that because there is that huge disconnect in terms of how food is produced and a huge gap in understanding. So we're talking about education, we're talking about, yes. you know, it's such a massive topic. And, you know, the days of social media and so on, um, information has never been so easy to get, but poor information or disinformation and misinformation has never been so easy to get as well. So... I mean, the the industry has a major communication crisis that has been brewing for years, and it's here, and it's here, and there's a huge change needed to bring about this um, uh, behavioural change, really, a huge change in communication and getting... But don't you think we can tackle this through the education system, and the education well, minister needs to get involved with this, because there, no, there's yeah. nothing happening in schools. It's pathetic. I mean, I've got boys at school... And you ask them about whether anything in their current ed education really links them to the story of farming, the story of how farming can address climate change or make them healthier if they ate better food. None of it's in there. So actually, we need to go talking about leadership. This has to be a root and branch reform of the education system as well, because what is more important to you know, the, the future livable planet and their quality of life and their health and the issues we're discussing? Yeah, that, that's who I was aiming at, really. I was uh, saying, you know, farmers, the industry needs to be better at communication, but it has to go higher up. And, and the, um, you know, if there's anybody here that can influence education, then that's who I was aiming those comments at, really. Brilliant. Uh, I'm going to have to ask a few more questions. So we'll have run out of questions and uh, people will be frustrated on the call. But uh, your answers are amazing. Uh, so uh, the next one for both of you is how do we integrate these solutions with the issues of food justice. That is, if current food production is unsustainable and food is too cheap, uh, relying on imports, how do we increase the price of food and value it while ensuring everyone still has a right to food? Because there is a great deal of food poverty out there. Uh, COVID-19 has shown to us the, the increased use in food banks. So we cannot make food that it's uh, unaffordable for people, but how can we make sure that it is of the price that it should be. Uh, Prasad, do you want to start on this one? Well, and you can keep it quite brief, please. I will. Yeah. Um, yeah. We spend is, food is we're in the, living in. Well, the UK is the third cheapest country in the world, isn't it, in terms of food cost. In Singapore and the USA, um, food is relatively cheaper there than it is here. But food cannot get much cheaper. Um, however, having said that. Let's just ask one thing, which supermarkets are growing and which supermarkets are shrinking? The ones that are quickest growing are the discounters, the Aldi's and Lidl. I saw an advert on the television last night, Sainsbury's are now price matching Aldi. Sainsbury, uh, Tesco announced that a few weeks ago, uh, or months ago. So price is key, whether we like it or not. Most people, a lot of people, I, I've got a saying that I coined a few years ago. Everybody says that food is too cheap, but nobody wants to pay any more for it. And I think, you know, we, we are always going to be hamstrung by price. Unfortunately, you know, that is the, the, the truth. But the, it's back to price and value. You know, that's the key thing. It, it's getting that message. Patrick? Well, somebody on the chat, when I was give, talking, I think somebody said, is it true that your cheese, a lot of your cheese is sold, exported, and you know, not sold in Wales uh, because of the price? And I, that is absolutely right. So it's an, it, the irony hasn't escaped me that our, quote, reassuringly expensive cheese uh, doesn't find a place in Welsh supermarkets, um, and is unaffordable for people who are on lower incomes. And the reason for that, of course, is in part, not 100%, in part because the so-called externalities, the damage to the environment, uh, public health and other forms of damage associated with industrial cheese making don't appear on the price. So you could argue that if you have all these mega dairy farms that I was referring to, they can produce very cheap milk, yes, and then 
equally vast uh, creameries can turn it into cheese. But what are the social and environmental costs of that cheese that you can buy so cheaply in Aldi or Lidl or even Sainsbury's? Um, the answer is we need to make sure that the polluter pays and those costs appear are integrated into the price of normal cheese, let's say that. But I think that we have to grasp the nettle that we are, that not only that the price of food we're paying at the moment is dishonest because it doesn't reflect its true cost to the environment and et cetera, but also we have to pay more for our food because back in the seventies, it was 30% of our household income. Now it's nine point something percent. So I think it, we will have to change this. And it, it's interesting that food prices will probably go up partly because of Brexit now, because uh, the climate change you know, response and the net zero changes and all that sort of thing are going to have to be factored into fu future food pricing. And I think that's good because in a way, to my, the point I started my talk with, if we only a few of us can sell cheese at, we're selling our cheese at £12.50 a kilo ex dairy, which is probably double the retail price of Sainsbury's cheddar or something like that, not many farmers are going to be able to do that. So there's a huge issue here about making sure that uh, enough farmers can add value to their food and sell it in a way which can enable them to get make a living. But I do think there Thank are you, more Patrick. and more people. I'm going to have to stop you there okay. because we have run out of time. Um, oh, I wish sorry. we had more time. And I think if we were having these sessions again, we'd have to put in an extra half hour if we can, because the chat part of this, uh, the question and answer, the plenary session, is really an important part of the meeting. Uh, and I thank you both for your contributions to this. Uh, for those that have put questions in the chat and haven't had an answer to them, we will follow up on these after the meeting. So don't worry, they will be addressed. We have captured all your questions and your points of view. Uh, but we now need to move on. Um, and I'm going to move on to Jane Davidson. And uh, as I said, she's uh, Vice Chancellor at the University of St. David's Trinity Wales. Um, but also she's uh, the chair of the Food Farming and Countryside Commission in Wales. And she's going to uh, put a spin on the whole event and uh, sum it all up for us and do the thanks. Diolch yn fawr iawn, Jane. You're muted, Jane, sorry. Apologies. That is, the, that is the statement of this year, isn't it? You are muted. <laughs> so, I do apologise. Um, what a fantastic discussion. Um, it has been quite extraordinary. And looking at both the amount of questions and comments in the chat, um, I think there is an enormous amount of material for the Food Farming and Countryside Commission in, 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 in Wales to look at uh, as, as we move forward. Um, I just really wanted to... Uh, pick up on on some key themes, not only that we've we've been looking at in the context of today, um, but key themes that have actually also arisen in the other country uh, routes to action that have taken place so far in Scotland and Northern Ireland. But I did think looking at the range of people on the call that perhaps I should say two things first in the context of the, of the Welsh context um, and very specifically um, what is agroecology? Um, we've, we've seen a lot about agroecology uh, in the context of the chat. People have talked about it um, in their presentations. We've seen the words used regenerative um, uh, farming, etc. as well. And it's probably just worth saying that um, the Food Farming and Countryside Commission in the definition of agroecology have followed the UN definition, which is an integrated approach that applies ecological and social principles to the design and management of food and agricultural systems. It seeks to optimize the interactions between plants, animals, humans, and the environment, and the social aspects that need to be addressed for a sustainable and fair food system. And I think it's just important to, um, in a sense, restate that because of how uh, much that links with what Kevin referred to in his introduction, which is the legislation in Wales, uniquely in Wales, which is called the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. And the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act has similar components to that definition of agro 
ecology. Um, but in addition to focusing on climate and the environment and actually enshrining obligations on the government in Wales and public services uh, to, to take that approach in law, it also requires those same public services to enhance a biodiverse natural environment, to maximise people's physical and mental well-being in terms of a healthier Wales, to enable people to fulfil their potential, no matter what their background or circumstances are, to create viable, safe and well-connected communities, to promote and protect culture, heritage and very specifically a named the Welsh language and that point about offshoring in terms of anything that Wales does in the context of improving the economic, social, environmental and cultural well-being of Wales takes account of whether that makes a positive contribution uh, globally. So there isn't an offshoring opportunity in the context there of Welsh emissions. The second component to that legislation is actually called the five ways of working and people have talked a lot about collaboration but very specifically in the law in Wales authorities are required to think long term to be preventative to integrate their approach to the goals I've just talked about, to collaborate with each other, that stakeholder involvement approach, and very importantly in this discussion, to involve people about whom decisions are being made. And if we look at that in the context of the, de the definition of agroecology and how well that fits with the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, then the big challenge is how then to make that journey without having a social justice and an environmental justice disaster in its wake. And Kevin, I think in talking about the Welsh context today was really important in terms of looking at the challenges, the challenges in terms of capacity and leadership and how there must be a stakeholder development approach. And that's exactly what the, what, what the Commission is doing. And Prussell tells us exactly what the challenge is in the context of small systems, 15,000 holdings, and what the changing environment is gonna to need to be in terms of taking this agenda forward and making sure that, for example, Farming Connect now provides a, a carbon footprinting service and we must actually tackle methane and nit nitrous oxide as well as carbon emissions and identifies the uncertainties for the future. Patrick, um, in his wonderful, inimitable way, talks about what challenges and changes need to be made to take agroecology mainstream and it is all about the money. It's about the money being removed from Wales and how that money needs to come back and be utilised differently. But I love that notion of the carrying capacity of the land and whether or not there is research into what the carrying capacity of land looks like um, in the context of all aspects of uh, Wales's ruminant tradition. We didn't have conversations around horticulture uh, on this basis, but I think that the two other events, which um, Verity will undoubtedly put in, in the chat while I'm speaking, are also worth looking at because they start giving a picture across the UK. And what's across the UK means that every country, they have different cultures, different heritage, different laws, and different outcomes. And so in Northern Ireland, there was a real focus in that event on what gets measured gets done. So really interesting work from the RSPB on carbon auditing, for example. Um, so just fantastic work, which I think everybody should look at, uh, from Devonish, where they bought a farm in Douth to demonstrate net zero by 2025, uh, while still delivering other public goods and started that in 2014. And so there's a really strong database of evidence in terms of how to move forward, both how you get the baseline using aerial LIDAR and ortho imaging, but how you develop the sole carbon, how you take an all, whole business approach, what your five year audit looks like. Um, and in Scotland, there was a real focus on, you know, what is the leadership 
to make things happen. You must have sympathetic government policy. And interestingly, Scotland is about to introduce its own Wellbeing of Future Generations Act modelled on the Welsh Act. But what are the practical measures to help arable and horticultural sectors? What does the 10 year transition look like, particularly if you're going to halve pesticide use by 2030? How can you deliver on the sustainable development goals and what do agroecological opportunities look like? So from our perspective in Wales, the FFCC can help the new government with its focus on climate, environment and the national forest, uh, using the five ways of working, using the goals and putting food right at the centre. Food has to be something for all ministers, education ministers, health ministers, climate ministers, uh, rural ministers, etc. economy as well. All ministers need have an interest in food. So how can this commission, with all of your input in a really collaborative, involved way, take this agenda forward? We're on a three year approach. We're one year in. And I just wanted to say this is the beginning of a major discussion across Wales and elsewhere. So look up the other work. Jochavar Yawn, Ir Ann, Velgadeirith, to Anne as chair, to the panellists, to the very engaged audience. You are our very own collaborative opportunity. And so I hope that you both enjoyed this, but feel now that through Kate Hamilton, who's on the call, who's the Wales officer, you may connect with any ideas you have in the context of taking uh, your, your propositions and testing data and evidence so that all of us have a better opportunity in going to Welsh government and telling what needs to happen in the context of building a, a, a socially just transition to agroecology in Wales. Thank you, Jane, and uh, thank you to all of you. And that ends the meeting. I'm sorry, we're overrun by a minute or so. Thank you.